Acts chapter 4, verse number 33. And with great power, say great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace, say great grace, was upon them. Say this with me, great grace, great power, amen. So I want to speak to you for a couple of minutes on the great grace of God, the great power of God, and I want to help you to access this in your life. God is going to put great power and great grace upon each one of you in 2018. I believe that this year you're going to see the great grace of God and the great power of God manifested in your life. Uh, the price for living a full life, I believe, is making a lot of mistakes. Learn from them. That is what I feel is the price I will receive to live a fulfilled life. A lot of mistakes, but I learn from them. If you just do mistakes and never learn from them, you are going to have a miserable life, failure, failed life. But I want you to hear this morning, the issue is not if you're going to be knocked down. The issue is if you're going to stay down. How many of you can honestly say this, this morning with me that you've made some major mistakes in the past year, two years, five years of your life. All right, so this message is only for you. Mistakes are the catalyst to the miraculous. Mistakes are the catalyst. It's the, the thing that propels you into the miraculous. If you have not made mistakes, I don't think you qualify for the miraculous. <laughs> so, okay, I'll just preach to myself here this morning. Don't let mistakes destroy you. Heaven wants to make you a great person. The devil wants to mute you. And both heaven and hell uses one method. Heaven uses mistakes to make you. The devil makes mistakes to mute you. That's the tool that, that heaven uses and, and hell uses. To get you somewhere is called mistakes. And I'm preaching you to, you to you today that you'll understand that we all go through these things of called mistakes in life. And the problem is we make mistakes uh, and, and we think that now I am a mistake or I am a failure. But I want to tell you here this morning, never let mistakes define you. You are not defined by your mistakes. You are defined by what God says about you. The devil wants to use your mistakes against you for the rest of your life. In Romans chapter 8 verse, 11, verse 1, the Bible says, he says, uh, that there is therefore now no condemnation. I want you to see the scripture. There is therefore now, when? No condemnation, right? For those who are where? Now, I want you to understand the original text, the Greek text, puts a full stop there. The translators put in there, uh, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Because for the translators, it was, you must do something to earn that you don't have condemnation. But the original text says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, full stop. If you are in Christ this morning, I want to say to you, there's no condemnation. You are free this morning. Because you are free, what happens? You can walk in great power. You know why people don't walk in power and the anointing? Because of mistakes. Because of failures. Because of, of things they feel, I don't, I'm not adequate. I don't qualify. I, I'm not good enough to enter into that dimension. I'm not good enough for God to use me. And I want to lift that thing this morning from your life because God's grace is sufficient for you. You don't have to do anything today for God to love you more. Honestly, I'm telling you today, you don't have to do anything anymore for God to love you. He loves you or He loved you before you were born. He loved you while He hang on the cross. Jesus knew that in 2035, in 2018 now, He knew in 2035 you're still going to mess up. So I better give my whole life for them, forgive them, set them free, that you can walk in the grace of God and walk in the power of the anointing of God. Say this with me, great grace is upon my life hallelujah now 
The enemy will like to keep you in a prison, in a prison of mistakes for the rest of your life. Adam and Eve, look what happened with them. If they have never sinned, I want you to see this. They knew God in a wonderful way. They knew God in a specific way. They knew Him in, a, in an awesome way. But they've never seen God's merciful side. Never. Until they messed up. When they messed up, they saw God's merciful side. Now, let me just color this in a little bit. Um, I shared it on, on Wednesday night with the married couples here. God never spoke to Eve regarding not eating of the, of, of the tree of, 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 of life. He spoke to, to uh, Adam, the man. The man's responsibility is to teach his wife the word of God. You have to teach men. You are responsible to teach your wife the word of God. It's not my responsibility. I'm speaking to the church here. But your responsibility as a man to be in the presence of God where Adam was and to teach your wife the word of God. Because God spoke to the man to teach his wife. So when they sinned and Eve didn't, he didn't teach her the word of God correctly, accurately. So she, she, she pushed him to do the wrong thing. He obeyed the voice of his wife. And sin entered in. 20, well, not 2,000 years. 6,018 years later, we're still struggling. Because the man didn't teach his wife. He pulled her out of a call. Pulled her out of, the, out of the presence of God. And allowed her to enter into sin. But just the whole thing, I want you to see this. When they messed up, the Bible says they ran around in the garden and trying to put fig leaves around them and, and, and cover them up. Then God walks in. Merciful God. And he said to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 2, Who told you, you naked? Go and read it this afternoon. He says, I did not tell you, you naked. Yeah, but we naked. He says, who told you that? And then God says, now I'm going to sacrifice a lamb. First sacrifice. And he cut it. He cut the lamb. And he made them from that lamb clothes. And he covered them. And they saw the merciful side of God. That he's not angry with me. He's not mad at me. As a matter of fact, because we sinned, I'm, God walked down cut a lamb, which is Jesus, New Testament, covered them with the blood, covered them with the Lamb of God, and placed a new robe upon them, the robe of righteousness. And that's why Jesus had to come to restore everything. Jesus came in the New Testament, and He walked into the garden, and He says, I'm going to have to restore the garden. In the garden of Eden, they messed up through temptation. In the garden of Gethsemane, I'm going to pray until this temptation leaves from me. The sweat turned to blood, but I'm going to say, God, nevertheless, my will, but let your will be done. And I'm going to give my people a new day, a new dimension. And in the garden of Eden, there was an angel that stood before the tree, and, and God says, let that angel stand before that tree. He will guard that tree that nobody else will eat from that. When Jesus came, he said this, now you don't have to stand there anymore, angel. I am now the tree of life. Anybody who wants to eat from me will now have everlasting life. I'm going to clothe you with righteousness. You're no, gonna, no longer going to be naked. I'm going to be your father and I'm going to be a merciful God. God is the God of restoration. He restores everything. Everything. Jesus came and restored. Mankind took away that, that, that angel from the tree and let people eat from them. He died naked so that you can be clothed in righteousness. Jesus died without children that you can have children. Jesus died poor that you can be rich, man. We see a merciful God. Now let me just say this. They would have never seen the merciful side of God if they did not make a mistake. Everyone that raised their hands a couple of minutes ago that said, I've made a mistake. I want to say this. You have seen a God, not as the healer, not as the deliverer, not as the, as the provider, but you've seen God on a different side. He is a merciful God. He is not a judgmental God. He's not a hateful God. He loves us. Yeah. Hallelujah. Say, God loves me. Now let me tell you this, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. I have made so many mistakes in my life in finances. I've made a lot of mistakes in marriage. 
Made a lot of mistakes as a pastor of this church. All these mistakes, I've learned one thing. That I've met a merciful God. Before 2007, I had an encounter with the grace side of God. The merciful side of God. You all know the testimony. I had a couple of encounters in my life. In 2007, I had an encounter with grace. I understand grace. I know what I'm talking about here this morning. So you have to understand, when I saw the merciful side of God, up till 2007, I used to preach judgment. Fire is going to get you. You're going to burn forever. If you just mess up, there's no more chances for you. But in 2007, I met met a merciful God. And from there, I want to say today to you that that merciful God is in this building today to make you whole again, to restore you, to bring life to you, bring anointing to you, to restore your marriage, restore your finances, restore your ministry, restore the church. Everything we know, we know because of a merciful God, not a judgmental God. Great grace comes upon those who make great mistakes. Now, write this down. You have, it's probably a point that I want to give to you. You may have made a mistake, but you are not one. You have, may have made a mistake, but you are not one. Hallelujah for that. You may have failed, but you are not a failure. Why? Because we serve a God of great grace. Say great grace. I believe that God's going to demonstrate His resurrection power in your life in this year. And He's going to resurrect you from the place of where you feel that I cannot do this. I'm not adequate to this. I'm not good enough to do this. I'm not good enough to be in ministry. I'm not good enough to be in business. I'm not good enough to to be a good husband. God is going to take care of all those things because we all have done great mistakes. Therefore, great mercy is upon us. Now, Micah chapter 7 Verse number 8, I know some of you have never read that book in your life. But Micah chapter 7 verse 8 says, Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. Don't rejoice over me, my enemy. When I fall, I will arise. When the church went through stuff, guess what? People rejoiced. They're not going to make it. And some people left. Some people went because what's going to happen and all these things. Guess what? Don't rejoice. Hang in there. Because look what happens. When I fall, I will arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. That's why I want to say, Lord, and I've said this many times, the Lord is not going to kill your enemies. He's not going to take them off the planet. God is keeping your enemies alive. Why? Because He wants to show them that I'm going to prepare a table in the midst of all your enemies for you. I'm telling you, we serve a merciful God. We serve a powerful God today. Shout amen if you believe it here. So don't let failure become final in your life. God will never define you by your mistakes. People will. The enemy will. But not God. Think about this. That the prodigal son, he left his ho- the, the father's house. And he left the father's house and he said to his dad, he says, I want my inheritance, I want it now. Now you can't get your inheritance unless somebody dies. So what the son actually said is, he says, I want the anointing that's upon your life. I want the favor that's upon your life. I want your name. I want everything. I want the inheritance you give me. In other words, you're still alive, so that means in my eyes as a son, you're dead. Give me everything. You're no longer my father. And he walked away from his father's house. And the Bible says he went into the wilderness and he started spending his life. And he messed up. He he actually started living with pigs. He ate food of pigs. How bad is that from having that life to this life? Just because he rejected the father. But the father did something which is wonderful. Every day the Bible says the father would go out and look for the son. I wonder when is the son coming back? Not today. Is the son coming? No, not today. 
month, second month, third month, month six. It's my son coming back. And one morning, as he went up, he never gave up. Now, people say it's the prodigal son. I say it's the prodigal father. Because the son left him. And he was looking at him. Ah, there's my son. My son is coming back. My son is coming back today. And all of a sudden, joy jumped in his heart. Joy came forth in his heart. And he says, I'm going to take my son. And, and as the son came, came walking down the, the road, he took off his jacket, the Bible says, his mantle. And he went. And the Bible says he ran to his son. In the Jewish customs, you must understand, if you run over the age of 40, you are considered a disrespectful person. You don't run when you're over 40 in the Jewish customs. It's dishonor. He goes, says, I don't care. That's my son coming back. He runs towards him, takes off his jacket or his mantle, because this is where the word thrashing comes from, that when, when a son or somebody like that comes back from, from rebellion, when they walk down the streets, all the people, all the neighbors would take their black bags, their rubbish, and thrash it over him. To say, you're no longer part of this community. We thrash you with rubbish. You're a rubbish. The dad says, I must get to him before the neighbors get to him. He ran to him, put a mantle around him. He says, now let's go walk, walking back. And he walked past all the people and they wanted to throw, but they couldn't throw because the mantle of the dad was covering the sin of his son. And he says, you will not touch him. I am going to restore him. I'm going to bring him back to the place of sonship, the place of maturity. That son did great mistakes, but there was great grace upon that son. You know what? I'm going to close because my time is up. When that son came back, the father never ever said to him, why did you leave me? Where's the money I gave you? Where's the car I gave you? Where's the anointing I gave you? What did you do? Never, never, never did he question him. The only thing the father was that he says, put on the music, get the calf, get the, get the lamb, get the ring, get the sandals, get the new mantle, get the presents, get everything. And the other brothers, they were accusing they were mad. They were angry. But I'm telling you, that is the grace of our Heavenly Father. That I have messed up in my life. I've made so many mistakes in my life. You don't know half of the mistakes I've made. If you know, you would have probably fired me from the church. But I'm telling you here, the grace of the Lord was upon me. The presence of God was upon me. And by every mistake, I came out more powerful, more anointed, more, more, more closer to God than ever before. Great mistakes, great mercies. Shout amen if you believe it, you're worth it. Now please, listen to this. Failures have consequences, but it doesn't define you. God knows everything about you. He knows your mistakes, but He still loves you. You know what mistakes does? Makes you feel stupid. I want to give you a couple of things here. Just examples from the word of mistakes. <clears throat> this was just my intro. I didn't even touch my notes this morning. Let's close the notes. Let me show you what I want to give you. Abraham, play something about the father's love or something like that. Abraham made a mistake about lying to, his, to, the, to people about his wife. He said, that's not my wife. It's not my wife. And the king then, and the king went and he took Sarah to become part of his wife's lineage or whatever. And then before they had sex, he find out that this woman is actually married. So he called Abraham. He says, why did you lie to me? I could have had sex with this woman. And he lied to her. And he lied to the king. He lied, Abraham lied about that he slept with another woman, got a child with another woman. But God, He said, uh, you're still going to be the father of faith. Because I don't define you by your mistakes. You're not defined by what you've done wrong. The purpose overrides mistakes. If we can move beyond our mistakes, God can give us great power. God used Jacob. Jacob, 
a liar, a luster, a luster. He lusts that woman. He's a loser. He's probably the biggest schemer ever. Schemed his birthright, schemed everything. God came to him, the merciful God. After all the mistakes, and he says, Jacob, let me tell you what's a merciful God. I'm going to change your name. You're no longer going to be called Jacob. I'm going to call you Israel, prince with God. Peter denied Jesus three times. At the resurrection, Jesus says, where's Peter? Jesus didn't go and said to Peter, Give back the keys that I gave you. Jesus said, Peter, upon you I'm going to build a church and, the, and I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on this earth shall be bound in heaven. He gives them the keys. Peter denies him. At the resurrection, Jesus didn't say, Peter, do you know those keys I gave you? Give it back. You messed up. You denied me three times. He says, Peter, come here. I want you to see. Look at this. And Peter became the greatest apostle, greatest man of God. God entrusted him still to build the kingdom of God, still puts grace upon him for his mistakes, what he has done. Listen, don't let mistakes hold you hostage. In Psalms chapter 38, just write this down, verse 16 and verse 18, it says this. For I said, hear me, lest they rejoice over me, lest my foot slips. They exalt themselves against me. When you fall, what happens? People laugh at you. Oh, no. Let me rather go to somewhere else. I don't want to be associated with those people. In verse 18, it says there, verse 16, it says, you will fall. You're going to fall. For I will declare my iniquity. I will be anguished over my sin. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm sorry about that. That's how you come back to God. You repent. Repentance means I get in a room. I lock myself away. If it takes days, hours, I don't care. Until I am restored in the presence of God. I will not let mistakes define me. Say this with me. I will not let mistakes define me. I am appointed and anointed. God defines me. I am cleansed. I'm a son of God. I'm the beloved of God. I am not a mistake. Stop walking around with, I'm a mistake. I'm a failure. I'm, insig I'm insignificant. I cannot. Stop. Nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the Word of God has God ever said that. He said, you are my beloved. I've got great grace upon you. Even if you messed up, I've showed you a couple of examples. I'll give, you, I'll give you great grace. And I've learned this, family. When I, can un, when I receive the great grace of God, Acts chapter 4, 33, great power comes. Because when we are weak, when we are nothing, He is strong. And He is able to do this. Amen. Did you receive the word this morning? Let us all stand this morning. I want to pray for you before you go. Psalms 145, verse number 8 and 14 it says this. The Lord is gracious and, come on, read, read it with me. The Lord is gracious and slow, great in mercy. Verse 14. The Lord upholds all who falls and rises up all who are bowed God is going to show His great power and His great mercy in this year to each one of us. My prayer is that when you do go into a place where it's tough and when you fa face challenges, that you'll meet a God, not of judgment, but a God of mercy. It says, I'm going to restore you and lift you up again. And family, please understand, this message that I'm preaching is not a message. It's a revelation that I live. I live this. I had encounters with this. I understand how God can take a nobody and make him somebody. I understand that when I've made mistakes, I've made a lot of mistakes. The past years, I've made a lot of mistakes. Let me tell you this. If it wasn't for his grace, there would have been nothing left of me, this ministry, whatever. But by the grace of God. Grace of God. 
By the grace of God, I'm still married to my wife. By grace. This is not, oh, yo, you're married. No, it's grace. It's grace that I can still be your pastor. It's grace that I still have my children with me. It's grace that I'm still alive today. Your children that are standing here this morning, it's grace that they were not involved in a school shooting this year, this week. It's grace they're standing next to you. It's grace, man. This grace. Nikki and myself spoke last night and we just said how beautiful it is to change your perspective. Just change your perspective. I don't like the church. At least you have a church and chairs, air conditioning. Sounds, change your mind about the goodness of God. Amen. So family, I want to pray for you. And then I'll give to Nikki to close this morning. Heavenly Father, would you please lift your hands. I release great grace upon this church. Because I know great grace equals great power. We are setting ourselves up for the power of God. So we remove all the limitations and the insecurities, the boundaries, the things that's holding us back to enter into the fullness of God. Let your presence now rest upon us in Jesus' name. And everyone say, Amen. Tell the person next to you, great grace is upon you.